one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I know you just had a long session with me, but uh, up next is our amazing electrophysiologist, Dr. Asim Desai, who's in the house tonight to talk to us about ablation. So Dr. Asai, welcome to the five-day group once again. We're super excited to have you. So tell us more about you and what you do and all the things. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Hello to everyone out there. Uh, my name is Asim Desai. I am in Southern California in Orange County. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. So I take care of the whole range of rhythm disorders from atrial fibrillation, SVT, to ventricular arrhythmias, also do implantable device therapies such as pacemakers and defibrillators and loop monitors, and then also deal with medications, so antiarrhythmic drugs and the like. Our practice is primarily electrophysiology, so I have two other partners and we just do EP. I've been in practice for about 20 years, trained up at Stanford, and we are a high volume complex ablation program in Orange County. So we strongly believe in early detection and early intervention for these different rhythm disorders, including atrial fibrillation. The, the best way to think about AFib is, you know, your heart's an engine, so you have plumbing, electricity, and valves. And so with AFib and other rhythm disorders uh, called cardiac arrhythmias, we have abnormalities that typically involve some kind of scarring of the electrical system that sets up these short circuits called reentry circuits. There's other mechanisms of arrhythmias too, but for the purposes of ease of understanding, AFib, if you can imagine it as a series of broken wires, typically occurring in the left atrium or on the pulmonary veins, although there are some other sites in the right atrium as well. It's a very common disease. One in four people over the age of 40 at some point in life will get AFib. So that's a pretty staggering statistic if you think about it. The, the, the key aspects of AFib in terms of the consequences are the most catastrophic is stroke. And so that's a cardioembolic stroke where you get clot forming in the heart due to the AFib because the atrium is not contracting in a normal fashion. The blood pools and goes up to the brain and other parts of the body as well. You can get thromboembolic events elsewhere in the arterial system. So stroke can just have heart failure. And that comes two ways. One is systolic can just have heart failure if someone has chronic tachycardia, you can develop a tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy. The good news there is if you restore the rhythm, oftentimes the left ventricular function will get better. And then the other is diastolic heart failure. So oftentimes patients who have severe hypertensive heart disease or valve disease or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they have diastolic dysfunction. And also infiltrative cardiomyopathies, amyloid and the like. And so as a result, you get these really high left atrial pressures, and then that also causes pressure and volume overload in the left atrium, stretches out the fibers, triggers these circuits. So the risk factors are typically age over 65, hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea is an increasingly recognized risk factor, obesity is a huge risk factor. And more recently, some of the studies on alcohol show that even one drink a day in a recent study showed a 16% lifetime increased risk of AFib over 14 years when they followed about 100,000 patients. So that's pretty staggering with regards to alcohol. It's not the holiday heart that we were taught. It's really alcohol has a direct effect on the autonomic nervous system, on the heart's electrical system. So we pretty much tell our patients to quit drinking. It's just not worth it. And then if you think about AFib as a fire, you have the matches and you have the wood. And so the matches would be triggers such as dehydration, alcohol, as I mentioned, sometimes sleep apnea, uh, any kind of electrolyte imbalance, emotional stress because the brain heart connection through the autonomic nervous system, you get a lot of arrhythmias that get triggered as a result of emotional stress. So people can have a fib as a result of that. And also if you go into SVT, you get pretty anxious because your heart beats going 200 beats a minute. So it works both ways. A lot of times people get misdiagnosed as having panic attacks when in fact they have PSVT. And by the time they get to the ER, they're in a normal rhythm. So our case we, tonight, by the way, that was exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And so the key is like, you know, most arrhythmias that are reentrant, such as SVT. And when I say reentrant, I mean, there's two loops and it goes around in a circle, like a vicious cycle. You have abrupt onset and offset, like a light switch. It suddenly starts, suddenly stops. And so someone with a panic attack, typically there's a trigger, you know, there's something that stressed them, but if they're just hanging out watching TV, for example, we love the crown right now on Netflix. Awesome. <laughs> if those of you haven't seen it. Um, right. And so if you're just hanging out watching that and then suddenly your heart rate shoots to 200, I'm sorry, that's not a panic attack in many cases. It can be an arrhythmia. So getting back to AFib, we have the matches, 
and then the wood. And the wood are the risk factors, the obesity, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, the structural heart disease, aging. And so if those risk factors are out of balance, the wood gets drier. And then as a result, those matches and that wood come together under the perfect storm to trigger an actual AFib episode. And then once that process starts, it's a snowballing effect. AFib begets AFib, more structural and electrical changes occur, facilitating more AFib. But the opposite is true as well. If you can interrupt the cycle, get into normal sinus rhythm, stay in normal sinus rhythm, the disease in many cases can reverse. Certainly not everyone can be cured, but we are using that word cure in electrophysiology. We never thought to use that before in the setting of the AFib. So you have the triggers, you have the fire. The other aspect of treating AFib is the follow-up. So if you do any kind of intervention, whether it's a drug or whether it's an ablation, or say, for example, a device therapy, which is sometimes used, you need to be able to have some way of monitoring that disease. It's electrical cancer. So every episode creates more episodes. It's a progressive disease. So just like any cancer, you need to have a surveillance mechanism in place to look for recurrence. So that can come in the form of an Apple Watch EKG, Cardio Mobile, doing daily pulse checks, periodic EKGs in the office, periodic rhythm monitors, such as a Zeo patch, or implantable loop monitors. And those have really become very valuable in the setting of EP because many people with AFib don't necessarily feel classic symptoms. Yeah. They may just feel tired and they don't realize they're in AFib until, or that they had symptoms until they get into a normal rhythm. So those loop monitors catch every episode of AFib. Most recently, Boston Scientific just released their loop monitor because Medtronic is sort of cornered the market. Other companies have loop monitors too, but Boston Scientific has one that actually works with a smartphone. And so you don't even need to have a base station. It automatically, it almost looks like a cardio mobile and it's, it's incredible. I actually just implanted one the other day and the electrogram characteristics are great. And so why don't I stop there, Jennifer? I, I gave a lot of information Yeah. and I want to go on to talk about ablation and other treatments, but let me see what kind of questions you have. Yeah, actually, um, I wanted to ask you about um, Chad's VASC2 score because we were just talking about that. So yeah. um, from an EP standpoint, how do you feel about people who have Chad's VASC scores of two, of one, and that are one other than just being a female? So I know that's kind of the gray area. And as an right. EP, how do you feel about doing anticoagulation on those people? Yeah, and it's a continued debate, by the way. I mean, even at the recent AFib symposium, this is a, a continued question. And the other part about Chad's VASC is it evolves, right? So you can have someone that may be like 60 now, but then when they're 70 or 75, and you know, your stroke risk can change over time if you develop other risk factors. So that's something just to keep in mind with Chad's VASC is it's not a single data point. And also to bring into the realm uh, HASBLED, the acronym HASBLED, yes, which yes. is used to assess your, your bleeding risk on anticoagulation. So there's lots of calculators out there that you can use, plug in the different variables, and you can get a risk to benefit of anticoagulation versus not. So with the CHADS VASC of one, certainly there is a role of left atrial size. So left atrial size is definitely something that we look at. Uh, left atrial size, left atrial volume index, the larger it is, the higher the risk of recurrence. So if you have someone, for example, who has an enlarged left atrium and a CHAS VASC of one, especially like hypertension or something, we definitely are going to be more mindful that, that someone may, may keep on anticoagulation longer. But Jennifer, it really gets back to, do they have symptoms? How reliable are their symptoms? And if there's no reliability, you have to implant, in my opinion, a loop monitor if you're going to make decisions about taking someone off anticoagulation. And then certainly with Watchmen and other types of left atrial appendage occlusion devices, there's other options. So it really is case by case with the CHADS VASC of one. Um, there's another question from Megan. She's our um, cardiology MP. Um, she said, can you address how getting rid of AFib and help address MR? And what is your magic number for starting AFib in terms of time, like seeing it happen on a pacemaker device check? Um, and a follow-up to that, if you see a pause in the setting of AFib converting to sinus, how much do you worry about a pause? So lots of questions for you. There yeah. are probably more. But atrial size, MR, how does it affect AFib? And then pauses. Everything's interconnected in the heart. So say, for example, you have mitral valve prolapse and you get mitral regurgitation. So you'll get volume overload, stretching of the left atrium, stretching of the mitral valve annulus, as that will then trigger AFib. And then the AFib will cause more enlargement of the mitral valve annulus, which will worsen the MR. So it becomes a vicious cycle. And you see that in the setting of congestive heart failure as well as systolic heart failure. 
So definitely valvular regurgitation is a risk factor for AFib. And if the valvular regurgitation worsens, it can worsen the AFib. And that's where certainly maze procedures have their role. They still have their role. So if someone needs to go to the OR for a mitral valve repair, ideally, or replacement, the challenge is in the realm of like a mitral clip, for example, where you're treating the MR, you know, what do you do about the arrhythmias? Do you do an AFib ablation separately? That type of thing. But you really do want to fix the hemodynamic component because if you just do an AFib ablation and the person has rip roaring MR, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like you would definitely want to evaluate whether the person needs to have a repair or replacement. And then that would dictate your strategy in terms of, do you do an ablation endocardial? Do you do an epicardial ablation? There's a variety of different ways to go about that. You know, as far as the magic number, we look at percent burden. Mm -hmm. Most of the monitors now, most of the pacemakers, et cetera, have a calculated value of percent burden. It does differ in the algorithm company to company, but the bottom line is it takes into account frequency and duration. And there, again, isn't a magic number. And this is the challenge. This is the challenge in day-to-day -day practice, right? When you guys are taking care of patients. So-and-so has, you know, maybe one episode of AFib for 30 minutes over the course of six months and their Chad's VASC is two, you know, do you anticoagulate them? These are challenging questions. And these are, this is really where you have to partner with your patients and say, hey, look, this is a gray area. These are the pros, these are the cons. We have some patients that say, in no way, shape or form, I, do I wanna have a stroke? I mean, even if there's a remote chance of a stroke, I do not wanna have a stroke. Those are the patients that you may be very more likely to say, hey, well, you know, the only way to really sort of give assurance on that is to do something like anticoagulation or a watchman. Now I'm, I'm talking about people who don't meet the classic criteria, as you mentioned, like the Chad's Fast one patients. So, but yeah, the percent burden is really what we look at because it's a helpful number because then you can kind of compare apples to apples. So if you have a loop monitor in, yeah. you have a burden of 20%, you do an ablation, it drops to 5% drops to 1%, and it's something you can show patients and track over time. When do you um, when do you not decide to do an ablation? Like, how big is their left or right atrial size for when you're like, as an EP, you're like, yeah, it's not even worth it. I'm not going to do it. Is it moderate? Is it severe? And I know you've taken another factor, you know, like sleep apnea, alcohol usage, all the things, but is there like a size of the atrium where you're like, yeah, it's not going to work? Right. Yeah. And, and let's back up and tell the story of ablation. So the first paper was published in the mid 90s in New England Journal of Medicine by Michel Hasegger, still one of the most famous electrophysiologists in Bordeaux, France. And so he basically discovered initially on Holter monitors and then in the EP lab, patients who would have paroxysmal episodes of AFib. And what he found were there are these unifocal premature atrial contractions that were you could see on the Holter, same P wave. And he took them to the lab and he found that you can map these to the pulmonary veins. Now, these triggers for AFib do originate from other structures like we talk about. In about 10 to 15% of cases, it's not a small number, you have AFib triggers originate outside the pulmonary veins, superior vena cava, ligament of marsh, vena marshal, the coronary sinus, the posterior wall left atrium, other types of arrhythmias, atrial tac, other SVTs. So those are important things to consider just even initially when you're thinking about an ablation is, okay, what's the culprit? Where is the culprit? What am I actually going after? If a person, for example, has like known SVT, and when I say SVT, I mean sort of abrupt onset, you suspect AV node reentry or a bypass track type of SVT, those have a high cure rate with ablation. Those will commonly trigger AFib. And if they go untreated, you can, you can continue to get AFib. So there are definitely those patients that you know, we're, we're really aggressive on. In the past, you know, AFib ablation wasn't that effective and was high risk. And the problem is in today's world, there are many healthcare providers who still think that's the case and it's no fault of theirs. It's just that our field is so rapidly moving that having sessions like this, and it's great that you're doing what you're doing to have sessions like this, to spread the word that we have amazing different treatments now for AFib and you have to use a holistic approach. You have to treat the risk factors and everything else that we talked about. But if you go back and look at who do you ablate, symptoms always comes down to symptoms first. So if someone's having symptomatic AFib, the key is if they're persistent, if they're new onset AFib, unknown duration, it's, it's never a bad idea to consider cardioversion just to see do they feel better or not, if it's hard to assess. And even if it lasts a day, you know, we've had patients that say, wow, for that one day, I felt much better. So symptoms, symptoms can be subtle. And then certainly young patients. So if you have a young patient and we see a lot of genetic AFib, a lot of athletic AFib now, and sometimes these young patients have no symptoms and it's, it's you know, there's a lot of different sort of thought patterns about why that is. But nonetheless, 
young person, you definitely do not really want the idea of keeping them on an antiarrhythmic drug or something long term. And, and the idea of keeping them run, on rate control and anticoagulation long term for several decades is, is really not very appealing when we do know that the heart is always better and the body is always better in sinus rhythm. Now, there have been more recent studies. You know, everyone used to quote the AFFIRM trial from 2002 comparing rate versus rhythm control showing equivalency. So many problems with that study. More recent studies presented at the American Heart Meetings, for example, and, and also released, looked at, for example, cryoballoon ablation early on in the treatment algorithm, comparing that versus drug therapy as an initial treatment and found that cryoballoon ablation had a better outcome with, with AFib than going to drug first. So that was groundbreaking. And you know, there's, there's debate in that, but those are trials that were just recently presented and there's a lot of excitement in terms of, you know, that's kind of as EPs what we believe. The problem is other trials like Cabana and earlier trials didn't really show this drastic difference between ablation and other treatments, but now we're really seeing because the procedure's gotten better mm. and lower risk, that's why we're seeing an improvement. And so with, with ablation, it comes down to symptoms. It comes down to, if they're young, definitely more likely to lean towards ablation if they have heart failure. So heart failure is the reason to do an ablation. It's, it's, it's not to avoid an ablation, it's to do an ablation. There's lots of data that shows that patients with heart failure, systolic or diastolic, benefit from catheter ablation. You put someone on amiodarone, you put someone on any of the antiarrhythmics who have structural heart disease, they're, they're at risk for proarrhythmia. So it, it, again, it makes more sense to consider an ablation strategy. And the ablation really needs to be tailored. So if you have someone with paroxysmal AFib, oftentimes it's just the pulmonary veins that are ablated where we encircle them with either heat or freezing uh, energy sources among others. You also can have these other sites that I mentioned. So when you have a paroxysmal AFib patient who goes to the lab for an ablation, we always have in our minds, we're gonna do pulmonary vein isolation, but you really always have to think about other triggers. And that's why you have to really do a good EP study at the end of the procedure. We've seen countless cases where the initial go around, a superior vena cava trigger, trigger was missed, person had atrial tack from the coronary sinus, they had AV node reentry, and those things weren't examined because the point of the procedure was to do a pulmonary vein isolation. So, you know, we're guilty as a field that we used to just pulmonary vein isolation, that was it. Yeah, and then we were yeah. seeing these recurrences. So now the two reasons for recurrence, number one, tissue grows back. It's pretty resilient tissue. That's becoming less and less because the technologies have gotten so good. So the second reason for recurrence is really a second site, a site that may not have even been apparent on the first procedure. These mm -hmm. secondary sources can get suppressed when the pulmonary veins are active. So you may not see them pop up until mm -hmm. after the first procedure. And then the risk factors aren't being adequately treated and weight's probably the biggest one. Now, I can't tell you how many people have gotten more AFib due to the pandemic because they've eaten more, exercised less, and drank more alcohol. That universally, we're seeing much and more stress. AFib in that regard. And stress. Because the heart. AFib. Oh, uh, yeah, stress. Yeah. A, 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 absolutely. So, you know, when you look at AFib ablation, yes, we do look at left atrial size. We, we look at, you know, there's not like necessarily an absolute value, but over five and a half centimeters, the chances of long term maintenance of sinus rhythm are relatively low. So, five and a half is kind of that figure that most of us keep in our head. But honestly, cardiac MRI has really been very helpful in evaluating how much negative remodeling has occurred in the left atrium. University of Utah has been pioneering that area. And so they've shown that you can have paroxysmal patients with tons of scar in their left atrium that you wouldn't expect. And then you have persistent patients who have like no scar. So I have a guy the other day, he's been in AFib continuously for 10 years, continuously. But he only has mild left atrial enlargement, interestingly. Why? Because he otherwise is healthy, takes care of himself. He doesn't have all these other things that are stressing the atrium. So there was this back and forth over the years about whether he should have an ablation or not. And finally, we, we decided together to do it. And when I went in, I did the mapping. His heart looked pristine. This looked like a atrium from a paroxysmal AFib patient early on in the disease. It was dramatic. I was expecting to see a bunch of scar. No. So I did a pulmonary vein isolation procedure with a cryoballoon. He has a pacemaker so we can track everything. Not an ounce of AFib, knock on wood, not an ounce of AFib, no antiarrhythmic therapy. I mean, it was striking. So we have stories like that that don't fit into the clinical studies. And so that's why you really have to individualize the patient. And you know, he's a young guy, many more years. And one thing I, I didn't mention is AFib is associated with dementia. You know, we're learning that more and more. Alzheimer's dementia, all types of dementia. 
and there are studies that show catheter ablation may reduce the risk of dementia related to AFib. So there's definitely a role, you know, for, for ablation. We're, we're going to it more and more. Chronicity is not necessarily a reason not to consider an ablation. We've done people have been AFib for five years, 10 years. You know, you, you definitely take into account if someone's got bad structural heart disease, those are reasons to consider an ablation. We used to say, oh, there's no reason that you, you don't want to do that because they're unlikely to stay in sinus, blah, blah, blah. But, but it's actually, those are the patients that have toxicities from antiarrhythmic drugs. Those are the patients who benefit from the atrial kick. Those are the patients like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Like we've done a lot of ablations in people with Hocum. So, so you know, it's definitely something that you want to move towards. And people often ask cryoballoon or radio frequency. Fire and ice trial, large trial showed equivalency, pluses and minuses to both. Cryo is really easy to do. The trade-off is that you can't pinpoint sites. So if you have a focal SVT or something, you still have to pull out a radio frequency catheter. Radio frequency, it's nice because you can be kind of mindful on where you want to place the lesions. The trade-off is that you tend to, or you can see gaps in those lesion sets. If you're not, if you're not really methodical, it's like drawing a circle. If you imagine the pulmonary vein, you're drawing a circle around the vein with the ablation catheter. You're literally like, it's like pointillism, you know, that, that that's an art, artistic technique that, that was popularized many, many years ago in the Renaissance. You're like literally pointing your catheter and drawing this circle point by point by point. So you can imagine how tedious it is. Wow. And you can also imagine the chances of gaps. Now the technology has gotten better, so, so it's much easier. But that being said, you know, those are kind of the trade-offs. You use more fluoroscopy with cryo than you do with RF typically. But the reality is nowadays, those of us who do a lot of AFib ablation, and with the technologies that we have, we're really starting to see, it's almost like the device industry now, one pacer versus another pacemaker. Now it's like one ablation technology versus another. You know, It's really about your experience and everything else. What we don't know what to do with are the persistent patients still. We, we, we have to individualize those patients. Paroxysmal, pulmonary vein isolation, look for other sites, optimized risk factors. Persistent AFib patients, still pulmonary vein isolation. That's still a hallmark of the ablation procedure. The posterior wall the left atrium is enormously involved in many persistent AFib cases. So we will often do posterior wall isolation. We'll do a box set, a left atrial roof line connecting the right and left upper pulmonary veins, a line connecting the two lower veins, and then a line on both sides. So you almost imagine a square in the back part of the left atrium. And what the, is designed to do is take any of the triggers in the posterior wall and prevent them from triggering AFib as well. The posterior wall sustains AFib. So when you go into AFib, that posterior wall is partly why the AFib keeps going. And so if you take that out, you reduce that chance. And there's a lot of studies that show that as long as you're, as you're mindful about it, you're not going to negatively affect left atrial function, you know, as long as you're not like ablating both atria extensively. So those are the things to consider with regards to posterior uh, yeah. uh, persistent AFib ablation. And then right atrial flutter is such a common associated arrhythmia that if you have it documented, we typically will do a right atrial flutter ablation at the time of the procedure. If they don't have it documented and you have a persistent AFib patient, oftentimes we will do an empiric right atrial flutter line because it's it's so common. The last thing you want is do an AFib ablation and then two weeks later, the person comes back in atrial flutter. Wow. The, the inner atrial septum is like a door between two rooms. You know, The right and left atrium are like two rooms in a house and they share this door and it, it's these two atria like play off each other. It, it, it's amazing when you're in these ablation cases, you'll see like this atrial tachycardia from the Chris terminalis in the right atrium. And then it transitions into AFib and it bounces back into atrial tach. And it's, it's really fascinating. It's frustrating as heck when it turns out to be like a yeah. six hour procedure. But most of these ablation procedures now are down to about two, two and a half hours. So I know that was a bit of a litany of information. I'm trying to like push out as much as I can <laughs> to your <laughs> listeners, but anything in what I said or any other questions that you wanted to uh, cover? Yeah, there's actually, if you go back in the feed um, and you look at all, there's a ton of questions for you. I think this is really a hot button. Um, but one thing I wanted to just extend to everybody, because I know you'll go back and answer the questions. You're really good about that, is that um, if they want from, from information from you, you have an Instagram channel. You yep. have ways to contact you. You have a book. So if you could give us a little more info on like how we can get a hold of you later. Absolutely. Or, yeah, or, yeah. Tell us all so yeah, my email is info at drasimdesai.com. So it's all one word, D-R-A-S-E-M-D-S-A-I.com, info at drasimdesai.com. And I'm on 
all the platforms and recently have gotten involved quite a bit in Clubhouse. And so for yeah, those of you who are on Club, but yeah, I mean, we're, we have a lot of rooms going, kind of talking about different health issues. So uh, you can feel free to DM me uh, I on Instagram is fine or Twitter or LinkedIn or any of those. And my book, Restart Your Heart, the playbook for thriving with AFib was inspired by a gentleman who was told nothing could be done about his AFib from a cardiologist. And we were able to get him back into rhythm and keep him in rhythm. And so he sort of looked at me one day tearing up and he said, man, this was a long road. I wish there was an easier way to go. So I decided to write something that basically people can just pick up and go one, two, three, this is what I do. But it's also meant for healthcare providers. It's meant to make your job easier. So these AFib conversations are hard conversations to have. They're long conversations. Here you can go to a resource. On my website, I have a blog. I have a media page. Dr. Haviza Khan, she's one of our EP sensations on, um, on Instagram, uh, Heartbeat Doctor. Yes. Uh, so Haviza and I did a uh, Instagram Live that I also have as a YouTube link and stuff on my website. I have a YouTube channel and there's stuff there as well. So I definitely encourage you guys to, to reach out to me. And I'm at Mission Heritage Heart Rhythm Specialists in Orange County, California, in case anyone's wondering what institution I'm affiliated with. Well, all great information. There is a ton of stuff in um, in here, including that maybe you can put links to the book. Maybe you can put the links to things in the chat. There's a bunch yeah. of questions about anticoagulation after ablation. All there's so many questions for you waiting, but I know it's yeah. late where everybody is. I'm gonna let you um, get get done with your day. But thank you for joining us tonight and giving us so many pearls. We're so excited. Hopefully, you'll come on with us again and um, absolutely share, share more pearls. Maybe next time we can talk more about mind body connection and, and heart. Absolutely. Connection because that's really important now that we're in COVID. So that'll be our next topic. Yeah, if I had one parting comment, it's not yes. about AFib. It's you guys, whoever you, whoever doesn't meditate, learn, and whoever does, continue to do it. Meditation and mindfulness is the new superpower. I would definitely recommend, and we're seeing that in all aspects of healthcare now, all aspects of business. LeBron James is on the call map for God's sake. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's hitting everywhere in the sports industry, in the medical field, and we're under, so much stress all of us you can teach it to your patients only a few minutes a day of doing some kind of mindful practice i use the call mat for example i was in a clubhouse room uh just yesterday and the co-founder of calm the ceo of calm the company um actually was on on the app and it was wonderful to kind of hear what they're doing and and exciting stuff so i wish you guys all healthy happy hearts and safety during the pandemic and hashtag get your shot <laughs> and have your patients get their shot. Yes. <laughs> Two hashtags. Right, exactly. So, and have your family get their shots. Yes, for sure. Gosh, thank you so much. We really love having you on and um, tons of questions waiting for you. Everybody's super stoked and pumped. And thank you so much once again for your time tonight. Thank, thanks for having me, Jennifer. Take care. Bye-bye. See you soon. All right, bye.